God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for all of your mercies. We thank you for your incredible grace, and we thank you for your provision. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that peace might be found in, within your walls, and that peace is not a something, it's a someone, it's the Messiah. And your hand has been on Israel, Father God, so we ask for a double hedge of protection over them as they come under attack. And Lord God, we pray for the soldiers and for the families on both sides, Lord God, that life is precious, every life is precious. And Father God, we ask that this not escalate into an intifada, Father God, but that you would intervene and bring this matter to closure. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into First Baptist Tuscaloosa. We pray a blessing over this congregation and over this property, Father God, that uh, we are in that tornado season, Father, that there would be just a hedge of protection about all of you and your homes and your families and these this congregation and this property. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together with one heart, one voice, and one spirit to lift up the name of Jesus and study your word to show ourselves approved of you. We dedicate this time to you and give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name, amen. We're in Exodus chapter 15, <clears throat> and we are looking at this uh, mighty crossing. And there's so much to say, and we've said so much, and, and I know that in the past couple of weeks, uh, I get kind of preachy as part of my teaching style, and it's kind of unusual for a teacher to go outside the boundaries of the text, but the messages are really Holy Spirit inspired when God brings something to my remembrance and has me share it with you. And so I thank you for the latitude and the grace that you give me to kind of, uh, not rabbi trails, but to amplify to, uh, this is an expository teaching. And so we not being legalistic right, are led by the spirit. And uh, if those of you who are here for Genesis one, I spent four weeks talking about the first verse in Genesis. And so there's much to be said about all this and much that affects our lives today. And that's a part of understanding why God told us this story and why in the book of Revelation, John talks about what is and what was and what is to come that we might know what took place so that history will not repeat. And so if we don't know the attitudes of the people, the pompous attitude of Pharaoh, the pompous attitude of Rome that still exists today, and even worse today than it was at the time of Caesar and Nero, as the Roman Catholic Church is making alliances with the Muslim world, you're now seeing a confederation formed of over three billion. So 1.8 billion Muslims, 1.2 billion Catholics now operating at the highest levels. Not saying that in the local community, that's the feeling, but at the highest levels, the heads of state, the Vatican, the Imams, the Ayatollahs have entered into this alliance. That leaves our numbers now reduced to 1 billion and of that one billion, how many are on the front lines? And so we can see this, this is unfolding in front of us. And we need to know the attitudes of the people who are deceived, and Pharaoh was under a spirit of deception. Why? God confused him like he confused us at Babel, but it was for God to be glorified. So as we read Amar Oyev Erdof Azik, Ahalek Shalal Timla Emu Nafshi Arik Harbi Toishimu Yadi. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the plunder, my lust shall be satisfied upon them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Nashafta Veruchacha Kisamu Yam Selelu 
Keoferet bemayim adiram. You blew with your wind, the seas covered them, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. The Song of Moses, we're telling the story in song of recounting this great demise that came and the great victory to be celebrated. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. The enemy said, I will pursue. The pride and insolence of the Egyptians are very graphically depicted in their confident assurance of success. And the exaltation with which they anticipated all its happy results. They were already reveling in victory when they mounted up their pursuit of the Israelites, knowing that they had been given silver and gold, knowing that they had been had their herds and flocks, and now they were going to take it as their plunder. Foolishly. <laughs> because their purpose was to go fight their workforce. So if they had overtaken them, if they had slain them, who were they hurting? Themselves. If they merely captured them and took them back without this aggressive, without this punitive, without this, this hatred bubbling up inside of them, they might have been able to think but God. They far exceeded the boastful declaration of the vainglorious Roman because his Vini Vidi Vici described a conquest that had been achieved, whereas in the height of their impious presumption, the imaginations of the Egyptians were already feasting on the fruits of a brilliant and easy victory. Wherever they had reached the camp or struck a blow on the objects of their mediated attack. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. Timla emo nafshi. My soul is filled with them. My desire of vengeance is satisfied. The pursuit originated in a determined purpose to chastise the rebellion as Pharaoh deemed it of his insurgent slaves. The desire of inflicting signal punishment upon the fugitives became more intense. The closer he came upon their track, and he is described in the words of this clause as having in fancy got them in his power, and like a ravenous beast, glutting his appetite with the luxury of revenge. He said, my hand shall destroy them. Korishomono shall possess them. After having dispirited and discomfited them, I shall exterminate them. This is the very attitude of Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler's goal was to exterminate, to make the Jews an extinct people. One of his life goals was to have the largest art collection of an extinct people. And he took it personally. His personal mission was to create, not like the Mayans, okay? natural disaster overtook them, but what at his hand he would create an extinct people. And God intervened. And so even today, we're finding caches of artwork that had been traded on the black market, that had been stolen from the homes of the Jews in Germany and Poland. This is nothing but the work of the enemy. And if we don't recognize that Satan's real, that our battle may not be against flesh and blood, but it takes the form of flesh and blood. And these demons, which we have countless numbers of them, we don't know how many are loose in the world today. It could be thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. We have no idea of the number. Looking for a human host to do their bidding. This is Genesis 6, the Nephilim. And so we see that in the personage of Nimrod. We see that in the personage of, of uh, if you watch today's show, we talked about the obelisk in Washington and the dome of the Capitol and how in, throughout the world there are these 
poles, these obelisks, which are built as a tower of Baal. Why would these architects do this, knowing the biblical import? Because this wasn't mythology in the Greco-Roman world. They believed in the person of Saturn, in the person of Zeus, in the person of Jupiter. In the first century, in that intertestamental period, 400 years plus the first century, people believed in this. This is what Mount Hermon, Nimrod's castle, and all of this has to do with where these gods were being worshipped. And it continues today. It says, Thou didst blow with thy wind, Yahweh like a consummate general, concealed as it were his plan of onset until the Egyptians were in the middle of the channel, in the moment the Israelites were securely landed on the Arabian shore, he who gathered the winds in his fist and bound the waters in a garment, in Proverbs 30 and 4, sent them forth as his messengers of destruction. The strong wind by which the waters had been divided and the bed of the sea was dried, subsided as suddenly and miraculously as it rose, or as perhaps may be inferred from the words, the wind changed to the contrary direction compelling the separated waters to collapse. With, re with resistless impetuosity, they rushed on in one stupendous billow until commingling amid the foam and roar of confluence. They rolled like a cataract over the host, sweeping into the abyss of the gulf of the pride, power, and chivalry of Egypt. Pride comes before the fall, a haughty spirit before destruction. Horse and rider or charioteer might be seen here and there upon the boiling surface and perhaps with desperate convulsive struggle for self-preservation. <clears throat> I'm not very good at the Latin or at the Greek, but apparent uh, rare non tes in gurgite vasto, but it was a vain effort. The gulf, after chafing for a little like a cauldron, exhibited ere long its accustomed calm, but the host of armed warriors which during the night had sped over its barred, barred channel. Where were they? They had sunk as lead in the mighty waters. Mikamoko Balim Adonai, Mikamoko Nedar Bakodesh, Nora Tehilot Ose Fele. This is every Friday night and every Sunday morning. This is chanted in the synagogue. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Who is like thee, O Lord? All the idols in our life, but there is no one like God. No comparison. And knowing how many gods there were in Egypt, this was now a new declaration. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Little E Elohims. These little gods are the gods of the dark side. These are the fallen ones. These are the watchers from the book of Enoch. These are all the way back to Genesis 6. Whenever you see the little G of gods, there were plenty of them. And they were all set out for the destruction, for idol worship, and for the destruction of belief in the one true God. How are people convinced to sacrifice their children? How are they convinced? What evidence did they have that these gods had power? is because they believe that every storm, every sandstorm, every windstorm, every flood, every action was controlled by this and that they were stemming the wrath of these gods. And so they were convinced. You've heard that the greatest lie that the, uh, Satan ever perpetrated upon man was the belief that he doesn't exist. But all throughout history, going back to the most powerful empire, the Egyptians, 
They believed in these signs and wonders, and we are looking for the time when someone will come and bring false signs and wonders. And will we be moved and impressed because we haven't seen evidence like that in our lives? Unless, of course, you've been to one of my healing services. And you've actually seen it for yourself. A paralyzed man get out of a wheelchair. That's not me, that's God. ABC News came out and interviewed and checked out the story. I didn't call them. I didn't tell anybody about it. But a man who had a broken neck, paralyzed from the waist down, hadn't walked in nine years, was told he would never walk again. I laid my hands on his neck. The bones moved. It freaked me out. And I didn't say anything. And he said to me, did you feel that? And I said, I did, but I was too freaked out to say anything. And he stood up. He pulled up his pant leg to show me how atrophied his legs were, and they were not atrophied. And he pushed the wheelchair away and told his wife to find a home for it. He would never need it again. Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Why are we surprised when there's a miraculous healing? But we've stopped looking for the supernatural. We've stopped looking for what God promised. Jesus said we would do even greater than him. How can we do greater than him? Well, because we have technology. We can reach more than he could reach. What are we doing with it? Are we arguing about... Who got slighted for Mother's Day, or whose son didn't call, or are we keeping our focus on the things of God? It says, Natita yemin ha tivle emu eretz. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. Who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods? Not potentates and great men. But the pagan gods, where Elohim, little gods, is used, and the interrogative form of the outcry implies a strong negati- negation. This is, this is here a retrospective glance at the grand result of the exodial crisis. This was a conflict between two spiritual kingdoms, the kingdom of light and true religion on the one hand, and that of darkness and idolatrous superstition carried out in the ceiling of appalling calamities upon Egypt, culminating in the awful catastrophe of the Red Sea, whereby was unmistakably demonstrated the insignificance, or rather nothingness, of all the gods of Egypt against the unrivaled greatness of Yahweh's sovereignty. See, God gives us this story to show us that, yes, the magicians threw down their staffs and they could turn them to a snake as well, and we're like, whoa, that's powerful. And they could turn the water to blood, but they couldn't turn it back. And they worshiped the frogs, but they couldn't do anything about them. And the darkness that plagued them, they couldn't overcome it because darkness can't overcome darkness. The only thing that overcomes darkness is light. And so when God said in the beginning, the first command out of his mouth was, let there be light, and he separated the light from the darkness and the light he called good, we began to see the duality of God that showed us that from the very beginning of creation, we were going to be in a constant battle between light and dark. Everybody knows the popular line in Star Wars is that, you know, have you gone to the dark side? And so it's become part of our culture. We understand it, but which side are we on? And you can't have one foot in two camps. But yet the way we've watered this down, it's okay to indulge in this, even though it represents darkness. It's a compromise over here. It's, it's just a Ouija board. It's, it's just a tarot card. It's just a game. But it's not a game. When you open your window of your home... You let in whatever it is that will come in through an open window. 
You can't put a sign up that says, wasps, squirrels, chipmunks, not welcome. And they stop and read the sign and say, oh, I can't go there. So once we open these doors and windows, anything will come in. The only protection we have is to close the doors and close the windows and be surrounded by light. If it wasn't important, God wouldn't repeat these lessons over and over again. The phraseology used in this passage, Mikamoka, who is like unto thee, was so deeply engraven upon the minds of the Hebrew people by the memorable song in Moses that in subsequent times of public contest between the claims of God and of idols, it was frequently embodied in the name Micaiah or Micah. See, this is the meaning. Who is like thee? So when we read the name Micah, this is why. It was memorialized in the name, in the naming. Look in 1 Kings 21.10, 1 Kings 22.8, 18, and Micah 7.18. Glorious in holiness, no attribute in the character of the true God presents a more striking contrast to the low and groveling qualities ascribed to the pagan deities that is purity than his purity and righteousness. The spirit of Baal was a sexual spirit represented by the Asherah pole. Referred to, translated, Asherah as Baal's rod. So every obelisk you see is an ancient Asherah pole, meaning Baal's rod. It is a phallic symbol in the world. And the largest obelisk in the world is the Washington Monument. So when you measure it, it's 534 feet, but if you convert it, it's 6,666 centimeters. 6, 6, 6. Was this by design? We can't ask. We can certainly look at the history of the capital and understand that this was something that was to become a shrine. Why does every church have a steeple? Every mosque has a minaret at the top of it. All these are related to Baal's rod. So still to this day, as they build, they build it this way. Are they doing it intentionally? This is how insidious a spirit is. It moves architects to design things which incorporate things that God said to tear down. He told all the kings of Israel to tear down these poles. Yet here we are in modern day, building them. It's the brightest jewel in the crown of divine majesty, shedding a luster on all other perfections and being that which most of all exalt him in the estimation of all his intelligent and moral creatures. His holiness. All of the other false gods are unholy. The sacrifice of a child to Moloch, the sacrifice of a young virgin, the taking of a life is not holy. We see no incidents whatsoever where God blessed the sacrifice of a child. 
The Septuagint represent, represents it in the Greek translation of the Hebrew, Dedoxmenos and Hagios, glorified in the holy ones, among saints and angels or unholy things, fearful in praise, to be reverenced with godly awe, even in joyful songs of praise, doing wonders or works of wonders, marvelous things. This verse contains one of the most sublime descriptions of the majesty and excellence of God to be found in the whole scripture. It is thus rendered by Boothroyd. I'm starting to give you citations from other references going back into the 17, 18, 1900s. Who among the gods is like thee, O Yahweh, who like thee excelling in holiness, off, awful, awful, praiseworthy, working wonders. Nakita vechas decha amzu galata, nechata vezocha el neve kod shecha. You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength and holy habitation. Shamu Amim, Yir Gazun, Kiel Achaz, Chaz Yoshve, Plashet. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Philistia. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. In this third and concluding stroke, the poet makes a natural transition from the justice of God executed upon his enemies to the gracious and timely protection vouchsafed to his people. The Israelites, after having been rescued by the direct interposition of God from the house of bondage, would inevitably have perished among the privations and perils of their journey had not God benignly con condescended to, con to, to conduct them by the visible symbol of his presence. And that safe guidance in circumstances so menacing and by a path so new and untrodden was a pledge that he would establish them in the possession of the promised land. So justice of God executed against his enemies, mercy upon his people. When we look in the New Testament, we find out that Jesus, Paul, Peter, none of them promoted the nullification of the law. They promoted the clarification of the law. God is a judging God. As a matter of fact, most people quote the passage, judge not, lest you be judged. It's not what it says. It says, judge not, lest you be judged. By the same measure you judge another, so you shall be judged. So I get emails asking me, what do I think of this teacher? What do I think of that teacher? And I say, I don't comment about other teachers. I don't want to open the door for comments from them. I'm held doubly accountable to God for what I teach. I carry twice the burden as a preacher, <clears throat> as a teacher. Because I spend more time in scripture with you than a preacher normally does. And therefore I have a higher obligation to the authenticity and to not going outside the parameters of the written word, but to give it to you in context and show you the deep connection of the foundation stones. And so when I stand before the throne for my reward, not only will I have to give account for what I've done since I became a believer, but to hear the words of how well I taught his word and whether the teaching was transformational or just informational. So sure a pledge was it regarded that the sacred bard, transporting himself in imagination to scenes of the vision featured, speaks of it as actually fulfilled. Thou hast guided them in thy strength to thy holy habitation. Canaan, which from the many revelations made there to the patriarchs might be called in a wide sense Beth-el, 
Beth means house, El means God, the house of God, from Genesis 28. And the way for their settlement, in which, he would, we, he, which would, he paved by the widespread panic which the events of the Exodus produced among the inhabitants of all the neighboring countries. They had just crossed over the Red Sea, and yet the passage is talking about as if it had actually been fulfilled that he had already taken them into the promised land. That was not going to occur for another 40 years. But because the action that was the catalyst to all of it, that was going to be the first payment on the insurance policy, the binder, if you will. You get a new car, you call your insurance company, they issue a binder. Okay? That means your car is insured. This was the insurance policy given to Israel that they would ultimately enter the promised land. It had become a foregone conclusion because of their deliverance. When you give your life to the Lord, it becomes a foregone conclusion that you will enter the kingdom of heaven. And depending on your theology, you can live a life the way you want to live a life, or you can live a life of accountability. For some, it's once saved, always saved. For others, can a regenerated, renewed, new creation continue in old behaviors? It's a question each one of us must answer for ourselves. It's easy when the Bible tells you this means this. It's just real straightforward. But it doesn't tell you that, does it? It doesn't say once saved, always saved. It says no man can snatch you out of the hand of the Father. So then, you can't blame anybody else. That moves it to a personal responsibility. God's saying it's not your neighbor that's going to cause you to go astray, it's you. It's your heart. The people shall hear and be afraid, sorrow shall take hold of the inhabitants of Palestina. Sorrow shall take hold of the inhabitants of Palestine. Terror hath taken hold. The people of Canaan are described as thrown into fearful commotion, as panic struck by the intelligence of the miraculous passage through the sea, and they're specified first among the alarmists as being most deeply affected by the subsequent movements of the heaven-directed immigrants. From traditional reports of the promise made to the patriarchs, confirmed by the consciousness of their own national Demerits, they must have long been aware that their country was divinely destined to be occupied by another race and that they themselves were by the same irresistible decree doomed to utter extermination. If the word of Abraham traveled and people he met along his journey had heard of him and had heard of Isaac and had heard of Jacob and had heard of Joseph. Was word just confined to the borders of Egypt or was this cry going out into Canaan that something was happening to these people had been promised and the time was coming close and these were the stories, the myths, the future. And now they're coming face to face with it. Would the world not hear about what took place? They wrote a song about it. They didn't just sing it and nobody else heard it. And the story was told And they knew. 
As we look at the, pal- the word Palestina or Plashet, <clears throat> Philistia, Palestina. The Septuagint has in the passage from Fullest Time, but in Isaiah and Joel, locus citaris alofuloi, the Hebrew word as thus is used was the proper and exclusive name of the southwest corner of Canaan occupied by the Philistines, and also, <clears throat> and such also was the early application of its Greek equivalent, Palestini, that Josephus wrote in the Antiquities, although in later times it became the designation of the whole land. If you look in Josephus' Antiquities and Rawlinson's Herodotus, the name Palestine is from Rome, calling it Palestinia Capitolina. As was their style to pick a name that emphasizes a name Philistines that would be a constant reminder of those who brought terror and taunted the Israelites. It was designated by Rome and has nothing to do with Palestinians. How many of you were aware that the word Palestine was originated by Rome trying to embarrass the people that lived in Canaan, in Israel, by reminding them of their tormentor, the Philistines. Chief among them was who? Goliath. Goliath. Now, if you listen to today's program, you heard that the belief is that Goliath's head was buried at the top of the Mount of Olives And that ultimately became Skull Rock or Golgotha and would have been the place where Jesus was displayed because it was a highway and was well seen. Now we go to a place called Skull Rock and we tell you this looks like, but if we go back historically to what the archaeologists have found is that David buried his the head of Goliath at the top of the Mount of Olives and that became Skull Rock, Golgotha. So there's many mysteries, there's much new discussion about the Mount of Olives and where Jesus was crucified, and where Jesus was buried. Until there's definitive excavations, which there's nothing going on at the top of the Mount of Olives because it's a cemetery now. It's one of those mysteries that may go unresolved until Messiah returns. But yet quite interesting and makes a lot of sense. But yet the Bible does not tell us, does it? And so this is where we have to look at the word to tell us what the word tells us and then look for the signs. There's things that we can read from historians and look in the Psalms, but if it doesn't say that David took Goliath's head and buried it at the top of the Mount of Olives, which was then the place of Jesus' burial, and crucifixion, then we don't know it for a fact. It's 1515, Az Nivahalu, Alufei Idam, Ele Moav, Yakazemu, Ra'ad, Namagu, Ko Yoshve, Kinan. The chiefs of Edom shall be amazed, the mighty men of Moab, trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Tipol alechem, emata vefachad bigdol, zeracha yigdmu, ka'aven ad ya'avor, amcha adonai ad ya'avor, amzu kanita. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of your arm. They shall be still as a stone till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased. See, the ransom paid 
for the freedom of the children of Israel was the firstborn. The ransom paid for you was also God's firstborn son. All revealed in this transaction of the deliverance of the children of of, of Israel. In the Exodus, the ransom paid for the freedom was the death of the firstborn. God's creating a pattern here. He's telling you that the ransom has to be paid for your freedom. And under the Mosaic system, you made an offering. You took from your herd of your bull. One bull services the whole herd. When you sacrifice the bullock, you cut off the production of life in your herd. You then have to go out and find another bull to service your cows in the hopes that a male offspring will be born and then grow to maturity to be able to service the rest of the herd. That could be a period of two to seven years of consequence for a crime you've committed that you have to pay for with the ransom of that sacrificial bull. Now it's no longer the blood of bull or goats poured out on the altar for the sacrifice for sin. We have one who was sacrificed for us, as was the pattern of the firstborn being taken for the redemption of Israel. Now God's only son was the ransom paid for you and I. Not unprecedented in the Bible. We read about it in Genesis 22 with the sacrifice of Isaac and God stepping in and providing a substitute. Now we see it actually employed. We don't know how many firstborn died. And now we see that 2,000 years ago, the ransom was paid for us just like it was paid for the freedom of the enslaved Israelites, the death of the firstborn. So if you wanna know the sovereignty and consistency of God, you have to look to his word, all of his word, to see the patterns as they're laid out, to understand the mind of God, the heart of God, that a price has to be paid. Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of a thing's in the blood, in the blood for making atonement. In the Brit Hadashah, in the New Testament, it says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. And so we see God's consistent in this. And finally, he put an end to the sacrifice for sin with the death of the firstborn, just as it was in Egypt. The dukes of Edom shall be amazed, literally were troubled, were in trepidation, paralyzed with terror. Halupe Edom shakes the special name which is given in the Pentateuch to the Edomite princes or philarchs and by which they are distinguished from Elele, Moab, the mighty men, nobles of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Namagu shall melt with fear. This means that all these generations that are coming, that are being impacted by Israel coming into the promised land, And so we look at the Edomites, we look at the Moabites, we look at the, who else? The Girgashites, the Hagarenes. We look at all these people who God has said is, they're against the seed line of Messiah, the Amalekites. By the greatness of thine arm they shall be as still, literally struck dumb with astonishment and terror, terror petrified. 
till thy people, till thy people pass over, O Lord. Pass through the intermediate regions on the way to Canaan, which thou purposed, redeemed, which is a recovered possession. This is a beautiful gradation observable in describing the distress of the people in the contiguous countries. First, there's widespread panic produced. Secondly, the rulers in Edom are agitated and perplexed. The Moabites, which is Jordan, are seized with consternation, and the whole Canaanites are plunged into a state of deep despondency because they know that if Canaan is the promised land for the Israelites, what happens to the Canaanites? They're out of here, struck with terror. Although both Edom and Moab opposed the passage of the Israelites, we see that in Numbers 20 and 22, yet the prevailing state of mind among the people in all the region around was, was terror, a complete prostration through uncontrollable fear, as described in Joshua 2, 9 and 10, and Joshua 9 and 9. Have you ever been so scared you were petrified? Frozen in fear. And some people have had that experience. Petrified. This is what's describing this uncontrollable fear. Tibemu, Vetitemu, Bechar, Nechelakha. Makon lev shivtecha, pealta adonai mikdash, adonai konenu, konenu yadecha. You shall bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for you to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. Adonai yimlok leolam vayad. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Another closing prayer, another closing line at the end of a traditional Jewish service as part of the liturgy. Adonai yimlok leolam vayed. It's the closing line. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thy inheritance or possession, since the ostensible reason for their departure from Egypt was to celebrate the worship of God. And a mountain was commonly chosen as the most suitable part spot for the performance of sacred rites. So Moses, who was well aware of the destiny of his nation in the Promised Land, anticipates with prophetic foresight the completion of the purpose for which they were selected in their keeping up the national worship of God in a definite locality. Some indeed, as Aben Ezra, Rossamur, Loth, etc., take the phrase the mountain of God's inheritance as a poetical designation of Canaan, which is a mountainous country, in that view, it was God, assuredly, who not only brought in the Israelites into the possession of it, but planted them in it by establishing the Jewish polity in that land. And so Israel is not mountainous like we think of mountains. The mountain in Israel isn't very high. It's not like the Grand Canyon or the Grand Tetons or what we consider to be mountains, but it is a mountainous terrain. There are a lot of ups and downs. But Hengstenberg and others maintain on the ground of the two following clauses that Moriah appropriated to God by the typical sacrifice of Isaac and on which the temple afterwards stood was intended by the mountain of God's inheritance. Rationalists have founded on this expression of rejection against the historical character of the song and DeWitt in his book, Introduction to the Old Testament, Parker's edition maintains on the ground of allusion to the sanctuary that the date of this com composition must be fixed after the temple had been built, but the reference to the sanctuary is so general that we have here only the idea of a mountain set apart for the divine honor and consecrated the habitation of Yahweh, an expression which in the mouth of Moses should surprise us the less as the whole system of laws in its ceremonial part relates to such a definite sanctuary of Yahweh, we must unquestionably attribute to him such a pre pre previous knowledge of the divine counsel. And if you don't know about the divine counsel, I'm going to encourage you to read Dr. Michael Heiser's book, The Unseen Realm. If 
you want to understand the divine counsel of heaven, then you have to understand the unseen realm. And it's one that will take you, it will take you up a level in your understanding of the gods, the watchers, <clears throat> the mountains of the Lord, and the full counsel of heaven. The Septuagint re represents this verse as an invocation. Asa gogon katafite uson. Bringing in, plant them, etc. Whether in this precatory form or prophetically expressed as in our version, the change of person is too common in all poetry to warn any conclusion being drawn from that feature in the poem that it belongs to a late and artificial age. See, people argue, when was all this written? And when did we get this? And how could Moses have done this? And how could God have inspired all this and revealed it all to Moses? But Moses is <clears throat> writing about something he experienced. This is first person record of his encounters with Pharaoh. But because Moses was a prophet of God, God was revealing to him what the future would hold in the promised land, and when he took him out to the top of Mount Nebo and he looked out and he looked in the prom into the promised land, he could see from the top of that mountain what lie ahead. And so was he talking about a particular mountain, Mount Moriah, where the temple would be the temple mount? Was he talking about Mount Horeb in Sinai? We don't know. And so what happens with these theologians, they get into arguments about the timing of things and trying to insinuate that God did not inspire this and this was not a firsthand description as how could God tell you, how could Moses tell you past his death? How could he finish the chapter? When we get to the end of Deuteronomy and Moses is dead and we're talking about Joshua and the first mention of Joshua, how could Moses have written that? Well, he didn't. Joshua wrote it. We know that. But we attribute to him in the first five books of Moses. So what happens is, is this is what seminaries are teaching and theologians are teaching and using these references and I take all these commentaries and I lay them out and I look at them and I can see why so many people are confused by it and question the inerrancy of God. And this is why the clarification has to be given that all scripture is God breathed and that you as an individual have to make a decision that it's either all true as it was written or it is all a lie. It's not whether the Jesus is Messiah or Jesus is not Messiah. Is the Bible the inerrant, inspired word of God? But it has withstood the test of time. And we're given the test in the Bible that says, you shall know them by their fruit. And so with approximately 2,500 prophecies contained in the Bible, over 2,000 have been fulfilled exactly as they were prophesied. That's evidence enough that if somebody's 80% of what they said was going to happen happened exactly the way it was going to happen, and the other 20% hasn't happened yet, I can fully expect with great confidence that the remaining 20% will happen exactly like the first 80%. That's the fruit of God's prophetic word. And that's all the convincing I need in order to embrace all of it as God breathed. One author, not 42. One book, not 66. One God. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and in some cases with his own finger, writing it on tablets of stone writing it on the wall in the form of the incarnate Messiah, writing it in the sand. That's all the convincing I need. 
And so these theological debates in many cases are more confusing than they are edifying. But if you're not aware of them and you hear a teacher teach this and it plants a seed of doubt and somebody whose faith may not be as strong as yours or has not studied the way you study, can be easily led astray and say, but see here, this PhD over here says this and he wrote it then and he has evidence to prove and back up his point because he took this snippet and this snippet and this snippet and that becomes doctrine. And there's one doctrine that permeates all, that rises above all others, that's based on linking together scriptures that are not directly connected, but connecting them in such a way as to convince you of an event that will happen either before, during, in the middle, after, or not at all, and there's no consensus. So if there's no consensus because it's, the word does not clearly say how, then people are gonna be caught unaware. It's the same way for a hundred years, Noah preached and nobody listened. And then it was too late. All right, stand to your feet. Let me send you out with a blessing. Numbers chapter six and verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the children of Israel. He goes on to say in this way, I will put my name on them and I will bless them. Please bow your heads to receive the ironic benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus our Messiah. Amen and amen, you are dismissed. Shalom.